Hello everyone, and welcome to Retro Brick Reviews, where today we will be taking a look at LEGO Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban, set number 75947, Hagrid's Hut, Buckbeak's Rescue. This set includes 496 pieces, 6 minifigures, 1 Fantastic Beast, and in the United States, it retails for about $60, where it released on July 1st, 2019. Although in other territories, the set released earlier on June 1st, and in others still, it won't release until August 1st. But without any more further ado, let's begin this review by taking a look at the set's six minifigures. Considering that this set is Hagrid's Hut, I think it makes the most sense to begin with Rubius Hagrid himself, who in this film also took on the job of the professor for the Care of Magical Creatures class, so I guess now he's Professor Hagrid, which is, you know, something that that you never really think about, but it's actually the case. But anyway, um, so enough about that. Um, the minifigure itself here is actually not new. It's the same one we got last year in the Hogwarts Great Hall set. And in my opinion, that is fantastic. Because, well, at first you might be confused because you would probably, you'd think you'd want a new version of Hagrid for the set. I think it's a really good idea that they just went with this more standard design, because after all, this is Hagrid's hut, and since the only other set to get this figure in was the Great Hall, this is going to be for a lot of people who that set was out of their price range, this is going to be their first opportunity to get a minifigure of Hagrid. And for that, and again, this being the Hagrid-centric set, it makes the most sense to just include a standard version of Hagrid. And I am really happy that they did so. Plus, the Bobaton's carriage set isn't going to be including a Yule Ball Hagrid, so you are still getting your Hagrid variant, just not in this set. So yeah, really cool that they did that, and I have already taken a look at this minifigure before in my review of the Great Hall. But to recap, for those who don't know, last year LEGO completely redesigned how the Hagrid minifigure works, so he has this one main big torso piece with the arms separate, which those attach by way of just Technic pins. And those have the standard minifigure hands at the ends now. The body at the bottom has a pair of short legs attached into it. And then up top you just have a standard minifigure head and a new beard piece. Um... The beard, I think, works really well for Hagrid, and is way more accurate than the one we got for the first decade of LEGO Harry Potter. It's quite wide, which really gets the look across, and removing that, we get a single-sided face that casts a really good likeness to the actor who portrayed Hagrid in all of the films. So that's really good to get. Um... The torso printing, I think, is really good. It's nothing super fantastic, but it it serves its purpose perfectly well. And for the rather simple style they went for for this figure to keep it within the minifigure style and not have it be too overly molded like the original design was, I think this figure works very well. Now, I do think it's a bit odd how on the sides of the torso we have molded pockets. Those are quite inconsistent with how, like, the rest of the coat doesn't have any real definition to it, so I think those should have just been printed. That's really just a minor nitpick, but just something that I find to be a bit odd with how they designed this figure. No printing around the back, but that's perfectly fine. And Hagrid's accessory here, while the figure itself is an existing one. The accessory is a relatively new one. It's the lantern, and while this is similar to the lantern we got last year in a few sets, it's not the same, because that lantern, the main shell piece, I guess you'd call it, was cast in gunmetal gray. This time, it's cast in a black. And, um, it's not easy to tell, but you can just sort of see how it doesn't really have that slightly metallic look to it. And then inside of that, we do just get a standard yellow, trans-yellow cylinder brick to get that light-up effect in there. 
And this is Hagrid's hut, so just like all the previous versions, this set does come with a bunch of other accessories for him. This is just the one it tells you to set him up with, and while I will go over all of those accessories when we get to the hut itself, I do think it is important to mention right here that the set does include Hagrid's iconic pink umbrella. Which, you know, is just a really important thing to have, so I'm super glad that he does get it in the set. And I thought, it, again, it was important to point it out here, since it is a big thing about Hagrid in general, and you want it whenever you get a Hagrid minifigure, so it is good that they included it. But that really is all there is to say about this figure of Rubius Hagrid. It's a really fantastic one, with a lot of great detailing, and it's great that they included him again in this set. But now, let's move on to the main character of not just this set scenario, but really of the whole franchise itself. So here we have the new Prisoner of Azkaban variant for Harry James Potter, and this figure is really good in my opinion. Now, just like Hagrid, this figure is not unique to this set, as this version of Harry also appears in both Expecto Patronum and the Night Bus, but the figure is wearing an outfit here that appeared in all of those scenes, so it totally makes sense for them to reuse the figure here. Plus, considering Prisoner of Azkaban's time travel hijinks in the third act, it's actually a really good thing to have multiple versions of Harry walking around. But anyway, um, his accessory is a dark brown wand, and if you don't know how the new wand pieces work, they were introduced last year, you get... Two of them attached together in a similar fashion to the key pieces that LEGO does and the daggers. Um, it's similar to those where you get two attached together and you just snap them off. So every set comes with an extra wand, unless obviously multiple characters use the same color. And these are designed so that they can be held upright or so that they can be pointed forward. The idea being that this would be used if you were like attacking someone, which I think is a really cool thing. Again, Harry's is dark brown. And just moving that aside, the figure here is really cool. He gets the new mid-legs in a dark tan color, and if you don't know how mid-legs work, they are four plates tall, so in between the height of standard minifigure legs and the short legs, but they have the full posability of normal legs, so like they can move all the way forward and all the way back, and they can snap off my stand. Yeah, cool, and um, in dark tan, those are relatively common, since again, they do come in three different sets on this figure of Harry. But aside from that, the only other way to get them currently is in the Stranger Things, the Upside Down set with Dustin. So, yeah. Um, the torso is not super complex, but it's really good to get, since I feel so in general for the Lego Harry Potter line, the most famous costume for a casual Harry Potter minifigure is a dark blue jacket. I mean, it was the first casual Harry figure that we ever got back in 2001 in that year's Hogwarts Express. And it was the costume that they used for casual Harry in his many 2010-2011 appearances. So it's good to get this costume again in LEGO, and I think this is definitely the best version of it. Yeah, you just get the light blue t-shirt underneath the dark blue jacket with nice zipper detailing. You'll notice that there is no skin color, you know, the light flesh tone, at the top of the torso around his neck. And that goes for all three of the kids in the set. And the reason for that is so that you could use these torsos in a yellow setting as well. Say, for example, a Lego City minifigure could also use this torso if you swapped out the hands. Which is really cool. And the back print is just a couple of lines to give the jacket more detailing and a single wrinkle. Now Harry's hairpiece is the same one that was introduced for him last year for the first two films, and I think it works perfectly well here, since in Prisoner of Azkaban, Harry's hair was a about the same length as in the first two, so it works. Plus it sort of helps to bridge the gap between how Harry is very young in Chamber of Secrets and looks a lot older in the Goblet of Fire sets. And again, I just think that having this figure combine the older face with the younger hairpiece just helps to sort of make this nice bridge between the two designs, 
which is good. Um, the face print we get here, I think, is a pretty good likeness to a teenage Daniel Radcliffe. It's not perfect, but I think it's pretty good. You can see that where the hair is parted up at the top, we do have his lightning scar in there. His eyebrows are quite thick, and I think the shaping of the mouth does a great job at helping along the likeness. Um, an interesting thing to note here is that on the previous Harry figures, the three different faces that we got in 2018, the one for the main sets and the two in the minifigure series, um, all of those figures gave Harry's glasses a combination of black and gunmetal gray coloring, while this figure just goes with the all-black design. It's not really a super noticeable detailing, in fact, I didn't even notice it until after I'd already looked at several of these figures and built several of the sets, but it's just sort of an interesting thing I found. And Harry, being the main character, of course, does get an alternate face, this one being... I think the idea is that it's supposed to be rather aggressive, although it really comes off just looking more miffed or annoyed than anything else. It's still a good face, don't get me wrong, and it has a good likeness to Daniel Radcliffe again, especially with the eyebrows and the little line between the eyes. I think I think this face might have a slightly better likeness to Daniel Radcliffe than the main face, but in general, I think that maybe just for how Harry was quite angsty in these two films, maybe it would have helped a bit had they, you know, given him a slightly more aggressive expression just in general. I don't know. But that's really more of a, just a super minor nitpick, and I do really like this figure. And that is the new Harry Potter, but now let's move on to, definitely of the Golden Trio, the member of it that is pr probably the most important for Prisoner of Azkaban. Definitely the most important in the film's final act. That's right, it's time for... Miss Hermione Jean Granger the brightest witch of her age, and this is another really good figure. Not a perfect minifigure, just like Harry, there are some minor issues, but overall this is a really good Hermione minifigure. Starting off, she again gets the new wand piece, but this time in a dark tan coloring, which is pretty accurate to how it appears in the films, and I think it's definitely the best color choice to go for. Her mid-legs are in a standard blue color, which are none too common, as the only other way to get them outside of this is with the Luna Lovegood collectible minifigure, and that figure was one of the less common ones of the collectible minifigure series for Harry Potter last year, so it's good to get those again. The torso is of course a new print, it had to be, because hanging around Hermione's neck we do have the Time Turner printed on, which is... Pretty cool looking, and there is some gold metallic in there, and you can sort of see the hourglass shape that just sort of outlined there in the middle. I mean, it's definitely not perfect. Like, I think it would have been cool had they gone for a, like, a more standout-y metallic look like the original from 2004 had. And I, while this is cool to get it printed on the figure... I can't help but hope that one day we will get it just printed on like a one-by-one one round tile. But at least we do get the Time Turner represented here, it is still quite good to get. Um, other than that, the hoodie printing is quite simple. Um, I feel as though for the sh sort of artif artificial waist shaping they did, it's done well enough. Maybe they should Maybe they should have gone a bit less with it. I don't know, I, I think it's done perfectly fine. It, and tasteful, I guess, is the word I'm looking for. Um, and then on the back, we just have sort of the same detailing with some wrinkles and some more of, the, or of that detailing. Now, th th oh, the place where this figure starts to get into a bit of a controversial opinion for me is with the head and the hairpiece. Because not long after this figure was revealed people realized that the face was not a new one. It was actually a reuse from the Pirates of the Caribbean Silent Mary set. And as people in the LEGO community tend to do when they realize that something is a not completely new thing and LEGO cut corners, 
They threw a huge hissy fit and declared that this figure looked really bad and nothing like Emma Watson because... Well, of course. Of, cor of course that's how it went. Why would it not go like that? And personally, I think the face is really good for a teenage Emma Watson. Like, in fact, I would say it's probably one of the better Hermione faces we've ever gotten. Like, I really like this. Especially the positioning of the eyebrows just gives her that sort of knowing smile. The freckles under the eyes are debatable whether they should be there, but personally I just think they make her look even cuter, which is always good for a minifigure because they're supposed to be kind of, you know, like, cute little chibi versions of characters. Chibi isn't really the right word, but you get what I'm saying. They're, they're like, simplified versions. You know what a minifigure looks like, and I don't, I'm not going to keep describing it for no reason. Anyway, and Hermione does get an alternate face, which is perfect for Prisoner of Azkaban, as this one has her quite aggressive, as we see a few times in the movie, most noticeably when she decks Malfoy into oblivion. But um, Hermione's hairpiece is another thing that people aren't 100% agreed upon with how it's good it is, and here I can kind of see it, because while I think the hairline around the forehead is really good... The issue herein lies with the fact that um, she just has too much hair. Like, for any of the films, but definitely for Prisoner of Azkaban. Well, like, her hair should not be this wide. It shouldn't really be going down over her shoulders. Definitely not to this extent. It shouldn't be wider than her shoulders. And um, the thing here is that this is actually not a new hair mold, but a new coloring for the Wonder Woman movie hairpiece that we have for... Well, Wonder Woman. And, uh, yeah, I don't really think this works. I mean, again, I get why they went with it, because the hairline is good, but everything else does kind of fall flat for this figure, in my opinion. But LEGO has actually made two different Hermione hair pieces for this new line, so just to give a quick look at those, I feel so a, an easy improvement is to use the 2018 Harry Potter CMF hairpiece, because the hairline here also has that sort of look where the, it's higher up the forehead. It, she doesn't really have bangs sweeping down at this point, but here the hair is, there's definitely less of it, but it does still have that messy look to it, especially around the back. Like, I really like this hairpiece in the CMF, and I think it still works quite well here, but personally, if I was Lego, the hairpiece I would have chosen is one that I'm sure will be a bit of a controversial opinion, but I do have a reason for it. It's the Years 1 and 2 hairpiece. And I mean, first off, come on, one of my reasons just because that looks adorable. You cannot deny that that is just a really cute combination, but my other reason is that in the set again, for Prisoner of Azkaban, in the set, not the minifigure series, but in the physical sets... Um, they use their Years 1 and 2 hair pieces, and while they do work quite well for them, Harry to a much higher extent than Ron, um, I think a, a good reason for that is because, and a good th reason why those work, is because, again, they sort of help to bridge the gap between the younger versions from the first two movies and the older versions we'll be seeing from Goblet of Fire, and probably Order of the Phoenix as well, maybe even Half-Blood Prince for the sort of teenage versions. It's hard to say exactly how long these variants will extend for, but for at least the next couple films, and again, this hairpiece would do the same as those and just help to sort of bridge the gap between the younger versions of the figures and the older versions. Plus, it would help to make things a bit less awkward with how now, oh, because of this, we have three different hairpieces for Prisoner of Azkaban Hermione. In the this set, the Hagrid's Hut set, just putting it back on. She uses the Wonder Woman hairpiece. In the collectible minifigure series, which those versions are based on Prisoner of Azkaban, she uses the Popstar hairpiece. And in the Hogwarts Express, which is based on Prisoner of Azkaban, she uses the Years 1 and 2 hairpiece. And I don't really get that. And I think it would have been so much simpler had they just kept with the hairpiece from the sets, not only, again, to simplify things in that matter, but also to create, again, sort of a through line connecting the figures, so there isn't just like a, just a complete huge jump from the younger design to the older design. 
But overall, the hairpiece is something that still looks pretty good, and if you dislike it, there's an easy way to correct it. But other than that, the figure is really fantastic. The face print is a reuse, but one of the best I've seen. And then the torso is just fantastic. So that's Hermione, but now let's move on to the last member of our main trio of teenage heroes that are like 13, but still are 150% more competent than like the government. And Dumbledore. Anyway... So here we have Runel Waslib himself, Ronald Billius Weasley. And just like Hermione, this variant of Ron is only found in this one set. And I think that for a Prisoner of Azkaban Ron from this scene, this is a really good design. Um, starting off, he gets the new wand piece again, but this time in a standard brown color which is probably the most useful color to get them in, and I think the most common in the line thus far. And that's just, yeah, it's just a cool thing to get for the wand. But removing that, a really awesome thing with Ron here is that he actually gets an exclusive color, at the moment exclusive, for the double-molded legs, because so far this is the only set where you can get them in a dark gray coloring, which... It's really cool in my opinion, and a great exclusive part that's going to be very useful for customizers. The torso has him with a red sweater, which is maybe a bit under-detailed, as in the movie it did have that sort of, you know, like the sweater knitted pattern? I can't really think of the word for it, but I'm perfectly fine with them omitting that because, I mean, it just would have been really complex for them to do. Maybe they could have, like, printed some dark red lines going down the dark red torso to sort of get that very subtle look in there, but I'm fine with them just omitting it. We have a good amount of wrinkles, though, and I like how you can see the undershirt, not just up at the neck, but also even coming out underneath the sweater a bit at the bottom of the torso. And I didn't mention this with Hermione, but both her and Ron have the same thing as Harry, where there is no light flesh tone at the neck area, so you could use these torsos for... Just generic figures from cities. And also, if you prefer to just have all of your figures with yellow skin tone, you could just have your Harry Potter figures go into your yellow skin tone world, which is perfectly cool. Um, obviously, Hermione really is only good for that purpose I just mentioned, because her torso is very specific with the time turner. But like Harry, Ron has just a nice sort of casual print that isn't Harry Potter specific, which is cool. And turning him around at the back, you just get a continuation of that detailing. Ron's face is a really good new one for these two movies. And I think it's really fantastic. This main face has him with this very sort of nervous smile, which I think fits the character pretty well for how he's portrayed by Rupert Grint. Yeah, I think it works quite well. The likeness is on point, I feel. And then the alternate face is just, like, my favorite face print Legos done in a while, because, like, shnikes, that's complex. Like, I don't, I can't really bring up words to describe exactly how this figure looks, because it's a complex expression, and I think it's really cool to get this. Um, I think the best way to put it is that, like, this is, like, the face Ron would make when he's at the Yule Ball, watching Hermione dance with people that aren't him. Because, and she's, like, f fraternizing with the enemy and, you know, junk like that. So, yeah, really great face to get. And like Hermione, Ron has had a previous hairpiece for Prisoner of Azkaban in the minifigure series that some people think would work better than the one we have here. I didn't bring it up for Harry because it's universally agreed by everyone that the skater hair that he had in Dimensions and the minifigure series was just, like, a generally bad idea with Ron, I will bring in his minifigure series hair, which is Han Solo's hairpiece in a dark orange, and... Yeah, well, I think it worked fine for the minifigure series, Ron. Here, it just doesn't work as well. I think that this hairpiece, just in general... Like, I like the idea of it with, like, the shaping at the top. It does work well, but it just needs to be longer and more messy. To work really well for Ron Weasley. I think this hairpiece would be great for, like, Percy, but not Ron. The Years 1-2 hairpiece, on the other hand, in addition to, again, as I mentioned prior, 
sort of creating a through line to connect the younger and older designs of the characters. It also just looks very good and very Ron-like, and in fact, I think that honestly this hairpiece, because it sort of has that bowl cuttiness at the top from the earlier films and the messiness of the later films, I honestly think that LEGO could probably just use this hairpiece straight on for every Ron minifigure from Philosopher's Stone through Deathly Hallows, and it, and it would work perfectly fine. But anyway, that's my look at this Ron figure, another really good minifigure in the set, and while we have wrapped up all of our main hero characters from the set, we do have two more minifigures to look at, so let's begin and continue on with who is definitely the most important minifigure in the set. At least, you know, in terms of a ranking position. So here we have Minister of Magic Cornelius Fudge, and this minifigure exemplifies something that I've mentioned prior in my Harry Potter collectible minifigure series review and in my review of the new 2019 Night Bus. That being where the figure is quite simple, but it just looks fantastic and very high quality. Like, the only new print on Fudge here is his torso, but the figure just looks really good. Um, He gets the bowler hat piece in black, which is none too common in that color. And um, removing that, his single-sided face is not new. It's the same as um Ken Wheatley, I want to say, from Jurassic World 2. I had no, I never saw that movie. But um, I think it just is a is a really good likeness to Fudge, both in terms of the actor and the character he portrayed. And yeah, it just works really well. The torso is again a new print, which is quite simple, mainly just using gray lines outside of the shirt and tie up at the top but it just works wonderfully, and it, it continues perfectly down into the existing leg print that LEGO has used for a number of figures in the Harry Potter line and other lines. But what can I say? It just works really well. No accessory for fudge, and if you're curious, his back printing just consists of a couple of dark gray lines, and that is Minister Cornelius Fudge. A really simple minifigure that I did not spend long talking about at all, but he's just a really good one, and he fits perfectly in the set, he works perfectly for the character. Yeah, a really good minifigure, and now let's move on to the last minifigure in the set, who is, um, definitely probably the most surprising inclusion in any of these new Harry Potter sets for 2019, a character I was not expecting to get ever? Yeah. Let's get to him. So here we have Walden McNair, the Ministry Executioner, and now that I think of it, this guy's probably the second most surprising minifigure choice for the 2019 set. Some, I'd say he gets beaten out by the clan-inspired Death Eater in the Rise of Voldemort set, but that's a discussion for later, but um, this figure is surprising because, I mean, dude, it, it, it's a Lego Executioner, complete with his axe, which is actually built up to be really detailed? Like, what? But anyway, um, his axe is interesting because it uses the six-long bar piece as the base and the handle, but that seems to be a new design for that piece, since it's hard to tell, but if you look closely, the black bar piece up at the top, above the sort of you know, up, up here we have this sort of nubbin. Well, this bar piece above that is slightly shorter, and the nubbin itself is slightly shorter, making the main bar piece at the bottom slightly longer, which is just sort of an interesting change that they've made now, I guess. Um, and then he gets the standard axe blade piece in silver, which is not common. We normally see that in gunmetal, but here it is in silver, plus just a roller skate piece attached on to lengthen the blade which I think works really fantastically for the design. But pulling that off, the figure is, again, just a really surprising one, but what also surprised me is how good this figure looks. You can see that he just uses the standard LEGO minifigure hood piece as his headgear, but we can remove that, and he does have his, you know, his sort of r very tattered executioner's garb underneath. The face print, I think, is a pretty good likeness to the actor who portrayed him. Not fantastic, but obviously if LEGO's going to make a new face, it makes it goes to reason that they would make it look pretty good for the character it's representing. I especially like the little broken-out tooth in there. 
The torso, much like Fudge's, is quite simple, just with some dark gray lines, but here the lines are definitely finer to create that more sort of messy, wrinkled detailing. And you'd also get a bit of his skin showing up at the top. Um, something that is kind of an issue with this figure and a lot of others recently is how, since the figure's skin tone is printed onto black plastic, the light flesh coloring is definitely rather faded, and it doesn't come out looking nearly as rich as the arm coloring. Now, personally, this doesn't bother me as much as it does a lot of other people, because I think in this scenario it can definitely be explained away in that McNair is just... He's a ministry executioner and an ex-Death Eater, and he's always wearing this sort of black outfit, so it definitely goes to reason that he probably wouldn't be getting an exceptional amount of sunlight, so I can sort of justify him being pale. But then to sort of ruins that when you compare it to his arms, which are perfectly fine. So, uh, I don't know about this. Like, I really want to give this guy a pass, but at the same time, I really want to not give him a pass. But I think I will give him a pass, because, like... If it, it doesn't bother me too much, although I could see it bothering other people, but I think it's not too big an issue. Anyway, turning him around to the back, you get some more back printing with some wrinkles and tears. And at the back of his mask, we actually get a little point there for the point of the hood, which is interesting since that's kind of a detail that is missing when you put the figure fully together with the minifigure hood. I will definitely be keeping the physical hood piece on, though, as I think it just adds to the overall look of the figure. But yeah, that is Walden McNair. Definitely one of the least expected figures to get from LEGO Harry Potter, I'd say, so it's really surprising that we actually have him. Even, especially from this scene, which is when we actually see him preparing to execute. But yes, that's just a really crazy figure to get. And it's good that LEGO did a pretty good job on it. Not perfect because of the issue with the skin tone, but it's pretty well done. And while he is the last minifigure, we do have one major Fantastic Beast to take, to take a look at. So let's get to that now, shall we? So here we have Buckbeak chained up in Hagrid's pumpkin patch awaiting his execution. And you can see how, ha how Buckbeak is just chained up using the small chain piece attached to this friend's handlebar piece creating a sort of attachment that goes around his neck and keeps him trapped. And obviously, if you want to free him, you would just have to undo one end of the chain and pull him off, and we will do that right now to get a much better look at this majestic creature. Because I think Lego did a really good job in their new version of Buckbeak. He has one point of articulation, that being at the neck, so you can have Buckbeak bow, which is a really cool thing they did. And you do get some great printing on there with both white and dark gray feathers. And I'm perfectly fine with them not continuing that further down onto the body, as obviously that would make it kind of inconsistent with all sorts of other Lego animals, such as horses, who also really only get printing on the heads, and then the bodies are just blank. So, you know, even if it is also just sort of a cost-cutting measure, the eyes are really well detailed, though. Um... And yeah, I like how they did keep the attention to detail, where at the front we have the sort of bird talons, and at the back we have the more standard horse hooves and tail. The wings are the Occamy wing pieces in dark gray, which I believe are a new color. Those can, of course, flap up and down. And those are just attached in using this little plate build subassembly, using a couple of 1x2s with clips and then a couple of just 2x2 two two plates. And yeah, if I can reattach that, the new Buckbeak is a really cool figure. Plus, because we get those extra studs on the back, if we wanted to bring in a minifigure, say Harry Potter, we could have a figure ride Buckbeak. Um, you're not really going to get three on there like you see in the movie, but, you know, just even getting one is a really cool thing. And obviously, if you had Harry standing up because he does have the mid-legs, you could definitely fit a second figure sitting down on the back, which is cool. But yeah, that's really all there is for Buckbeak. So moving him out of the way, we do again get the pumpkin patch as a little side build to go with Hagrid's hut. And moving the chain out of the way a bit, you get that post in the back it's attached to. Then we have our two main sections of the pumpkin patch. 
On the left here, we get two minifigure head pumpkins, which obviously are just orange minifigure heads with the new flower piece on top. And on the other side, we get these larger pumpkins, which have some leaves at the bottom. The pumpkin itself is actually a newly molded piece, which is really cool to get. We get four of this new pumpkin in the set, and these are definitely the most accurate and realistic pumpkins LEGO's ever done, while still maintaining that very cartoonish style, which is cool. And again, you get two of them on this side, and on this side you get two of them, but just one of the minifigure head pumpkins. And obviously these don't really do a fantastic job at representing how Hagrid is cultivating giant pumpkins, but it makes sense since obviously they wouldn't want to make the pumpkin piece specifically for the set. They would want to make it more universal, and to do that they had to scale the pumpkins more to a standard minifigure and make them look good in normal scenarios. So I'm perfectly good with that, I just think it's cool that we even got a new pumpkin piece. But, enough about the pumpkin patch, it's time to move on, it's time to, move on to the main event of the set, that being Hagrid's Hut itself. So here we have Hagrid's Hut, which I think is a really fantastically designed LEGO structure, and it's actually way better than I thought it was going to be when I before I pulled it out of the box. Similar to the night bus in that regard, actually. In general, this this wave of sets really surprised me with how much better they they were than I was expecting them to be. A lot of that those low expectations coming from other people talking about how the sets were pretty bad. Don't know where they were coming from, but I'm, first off, for scaling, if you're curious, this is how the set scales next to the Hagrid figure, meaning that there is enough room for Hagrid to fit through his front door which is cool, and there will be a bit of squeezing because of his arm width, but overall, he will fit through if you try to put him through. That door in question does have a sticker for detailing on the front of it, but before we go into any more detailing, a very helpful feature that we get here is that, of course, while the we get the double hut set up in The Prisoner of Azkaban, the first two movies had just the single hut, without the smaller section off to the side. And it was a different design, but, you know, if you wanted to have this in a Philosopher's Stone setup, you could easily sort of approximate that by just taking off the smaller section, because it attaches with just a few pins, or, well, one pin and a couple of axles. So now we can just take a better look at this section. Starting up on top, you have that sort of cone shape with the more sloped plates coming in down the sides to give it that two surfaced slope, which I think is really cool. Um, maybe these, again, the sort of sloped plates go up a bit higher than they should, but overall it gets the, the look across really well. Over on this side we get a chimney, which is important for an action feature, and over here we just get some foliage. Down here we get some more foliage with some roots going off into the ground, as well as some brick detailing built onto the sides of the house. We have two different designs for windows. On this side, we get a pair of the lattice windows from the Hogwarts Great Hall. And over here, we get a more standard city design for windows. Because this side of the hut is usually covered by the second smaller section of it. Here, we just have an open doorway with no real detailing. And over here, though, we get a sticker, which is fine. Has a good amount of detail to it, but in general, I think the design would have looked just better had instead of doing this, they would have continued with the brick-built design we have on the other sides, and, like, with the textures and the actual foliage. And again, this isn't bad, it just breaks up the consistency a bit, which is unfortunate. But anyway, moving into the hut itself, we have a really good interior for this section with a lot of space, way more than I'd expected. You could get quite a few figures in here, actually, um... Like, just right up here at the front, you have this table with spots for too many figures. And while I'm not going to sit in every figure, because that would take a while, you can sort of see how, like, yeah, you could easily fit in, like, a figure here and a figure in the other chair. And you could also definitely fit a figure sort of in the corner, just sort of standing over here. You fit someone standing over here, someone standing over here at, or at the table... Then you get an armchair in the back, which you could also fit a figure in. 
as well as a little sack attached to a jumper. And in the background there, you might not be able to see it, but you do have the standard new Harry Potter candle pieces, which is cool to see. Then in this corner, we have a crate containing a silver shovel, as well as Hagrid's umbrella. I had it with the official minifigure that we get in the set, but this is where it does go when you build the set originally. And then I'm in the back. It'll be easier if I remove these bits to see. Um, you get a broom over here, as well as this 1x6 tile, which is stickered with a wood grain design. And what's cool about that is if you press down on the chimney, you can sort of see an actuator, and the fireplace lights up with an orange light brick. And that's cool to see. You have a couple of flames in the fireplace. And yeah, just a cool feature to give this set a bit more life to it. And in the fireplace, you do get an egg, which is easily removable. It doesn't attach with any studs. And this is just in a light tan color. It's definitely meant to represent Norbert's egg, which is a really cool thing to get and a nice reference back to the first film slash book. And yeah, the only other way to get this light tan egg is in the Jurassic World Triceratops set, so this is definitely... Well, it's not an easier way, since the sets are the same price now, come to think of it, but um, I'd say that overall this set is a much better value way to get those, if that's just the part you're after, even though that set does come with more of them. I don't know. But anyway, to finish off this section, hanging in the rafters, we have some nice tools from left to right, those being a cleaver, a bucket, a whip, a spoon, and a gold frying pan. And then we can just reattach in these details like so and just move this off to the side and get in at the smaller section of the hut which has a similar roof design just using smaller sloped pieces forgot to mention on the first half but i really like the use of the sand green up at the top that just creates sort of a nice contrast with how the rest of the moss is in olive green Plus, you know, just in general, I like sand green, and it associates this set a lot with how the older Hagrid's huts often used a lot of sand green roof pieces, same as the original Hogwarts sets, and how they sort of reference that now by using the sand green ski poles for lightning rods. So cool to see that here. And then moving down, you have sort of the same thing as the other side, where we have the brick-built walls, this time for the front and the one side, with the bricks and the texturing and the windows. Here we have another door. Here we have an open doorway that connects to the other side. And here we have another sticker, which uh, I, again, don't like this one, especially, like, this is my least favorite wall piece, because I don't like that little cutout window. That's always looked pretty funky to me, and I've just never liked that piece. And again, it doesn't look bad, just my personal preference that would have been more cohesive had they just continued with brick-built designing. This area has a much smaller interior space, but you still get a lot of size to it, and especially a lot of depth. Like, that has to be the best thing about the interior. Like, even in this smaller section, you get, like, seven studs of depth, which is really fantastic, for a set of this size, like, very few LEGO sets give you that much depth for your interior, so it's really good when you do get that much. This side, the interior is definitely less than the other side, but it is still quite nice. In the corner here, you have this sort of study desk, which Hagrid can just barely fit there in the chair standing up and leaning back a bit, but it's really designed for a minifigure to sit there, for example, Ron. But just removing that chair and desk, you can see that the desk on it has a sticker with the, well, no, it's a printed piece, actually, of the Daily Prophet, which comes in the Night Bus this year, as well as a few sets last year. And, um, I really wish, and I mentioned this in the Night Bus, that it would have been great had they included the serious Black newspaper in these sets. Like, it, I think it's totally worth a new print, or again, I would have even preferred had they just given it to us as a sticker. I think it's just really unfortunate that we're not getting that iconic thing from the film. And then you do also get a candle, which this time is using just a cylinder piece, probably to represent that this candle was crafted by Hagrid himself, and therefore is of slightly lower craftsmanship. Then over here in the corner, we get a chest containing a chocolate frog, 
which is, you know, not something that pertains super much to the situation. It is a cool accessory to get, don't get me wrong. But I just feel as though maybe they could have included something that just matters a bit more to the scene. Like, maybe they could have included, like, a... Just the chicken leg piece in there to represent a dead ferret, for example. Or maybe have scabbers hiding in there. I don't know, but last thing to mention here is that in the rafters, we'd have a single spider crawling around for you to follow. And in general, again, I really like how in the set they give you those nice, cute little references to Philosopher's Stone and Chamber of Secrets. And now just bringing the hut over here that is really there is to say about this build. It's not super complex, but it looks really fantastic. The interior gives you a ton of detailing, and you could easily fit all of the figures you get in the set in here. Plus, definitely a few more as well. Like, you just get so much space in here and so many accessories. And then from the front, it's just a really nice, uniquely designed build with this nice circular exterior, some different surfaces to build on, some great texture. It's just really fantastic, and I love the set. But before we wrap up the video, well, let's take a look at the box, instruction manual, and extra pieces. The set's box is made of cardboard, and it is pretty nice. It has the same conventions as all the sets for this wave of the Harry Potter line have, with the Harry Potter text at the top now being in gold instead of silver, and the Wizarding World logo being corded off by a spell. At the left, we have our standard set info, and at the bottom left, we have our minifigure list. Notice how the figures for Mr. Fudge and Mr. McNair do not actually get their actual names, and are just given their titles. I'm okay with that with McNair, since he is a quite minor character, but I'm surprised that they didn't at least give Fudge, at least title him like Minister Fudge or something, since there are multiple ministers over the course of the series. I don't know. But anyway, then um, we do get a couple of warnings, one showing that the set includes a light brick, and another that batteries are included. So it's cool to get those, um... Up at the top, we have a list of all of our figures, plus a couple of our builds in Buckbeak, and we get Hermione as the actual size reference. Over here, we get some more languages, and that same picture on the front of the box. Here we get uh, the fact that the set does include batteries and a light brick, as well as a LEGO Life ad for all you fans of LEGO Life, wherever you may be. I personally think you don't exist, but oh well. Then up at the top, we get a couple of images showing some scenes that you could put the figures in on the inside. And, like, you can really see in that middle one how you can really fit quite a few figures around that table. Like, you get all four of them in there, and it just looks really good, in my opinion. And you can also see how the light brick feature works. And then in the back, you just get another image for the main image, where we have all of our figures around the back side of the model, with Harry flying away on Buckbeak. Yeah, cool box. The instruction manual has this QR code on the front, which allows you to scan the digital building instructions onto your tablet. I don't know why you can't just go to lego.com to download them as a PDF, but I guess you can't. Also, I don't know why you can't just use the very nice paper manual they provide to you for free, but, you know, I guess some people just don't like paper nowadays for some reason. I mean, I don't know. If, I mean, if, the, if it comes to the set, you might as well use it. Then we get, like, a bunch of different things telling you how batteries work. The set comes in three bags, and there is a total of 113 pages of building, plus one at the end showing everything gathered up. Then we have this picture showing showing an ad for, I guess, Creator, plus Lego Life up at the top. And this image showing four of the five new sets, excluding the Night Bus. And these are noted to have limited availability, which I don't really get. I guess that might be because these kind of got an early release in the U.S., only at Lego stores and Barnes & Noble at the moment, so I don't know. But anyway, then over here, we have the three Hogwarts sets so far lined up. The Great Hall, Whomping Willow, and Clock Tower. This time, the limited availability makes perfect sense, since the Great Hall and, and Whomping Willow at this point are a year old. So, it makes sense that it that they will be retiring a lot sooner than these new sets. Then we just get our parts list and Win Kid. Actually, it's a Win minifigure. Does anyone know what happened to Win Kid? Because, like, at some point, I want to say around, like, 2014, they just switched from Win Kid to Win Minifigures, and they never looked back. And, gotta say, I miss Win Kid. 
Oh well. We get a pretty good selection of extra parts with the set. Some highlights being this black Technic ball piece, which is pretty good for a bludger for those of you who don't have anything to represent an accurate bludger because with the Quidditch match set, we just got black studs for some reason. We get a brown stamp piece, silver arrow. We get the new wand sprues and all three wand colors from the set. And these are the newer, less useful versions, but still notable to get. And of course, we do also get spares of each of the wand colors as well. We get a spare flame piece and candle flame piece, a spare spoon, which is definitely my favorite extra, and even a spare ice skate. So yeah, some pretty cool extras, nothing too fantastic. But yeah, so that's basically all we have to look at for this set, so now let's move on to my final thoughts. So overall, for $60 US, would I recommend Lego Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban 75947 Hagrid's Hut Buckbeaks Rescue. Yeah, I'd say so. I mean, when I first saw pictures of this set, and, when I, and even when I'd actually bought it and I had the box in my hands, the set really... I had trouble seeing it for 60 bucks. Like, I thought of this set since the beginning as the perfect... $50 set. Like, the moment I saw the pictures, I was like, oh, that's like the best $50 set Legos ever made. It's a fantastic value for 50 bucks. And then I found out that it was 60 bucks. But, and now that I actually have the set, said, now that I have the set, and I've built it and I know it's included, the $60 price makes a lot of sense to me because this set is way bigger than I thought it was going to be. You have so much more space on the interior. The exterior, I don't know why, but in person it looks a lot better than on the box. Obviously, Buckbeak's a new mold. Hagrid has some expensive larger pieces to him. The pumpkins are a new piece as well. You get a light brick. I mean, yeah. And all of the figures are fantastic. Several of them being new and exclusive to the set. One of them in Hermione even getting a new, newly colored hair piece. And yeah, so I can definitely see the price to the set being fine, and I mean, I think it's perfectly fine paying it. I mean, I did, didn't I? I mean, in general, I feel as though the set definitely isn't priced as well as some of the sets last year, but overall, I feel as though the price-to-part ratio with the set is deceiving, because again, like, it is only about 500 parts, but a lot of those parts are big parts. Like, for example, like, in this building, like this smaller section of the hut, three of these five walls, the one over here that's hidden, the door, and this one with the panel wall piece, three of those five walls are mainly made up using only a couple of pieces. And the same goes for the larger hut as well, just to a lesser extent, so you do have some extra pieces added in, to f and because those walls are bigger. But still, like, the set is a lot bigger than you'd think it is based on the price, you have way more stuff to do in it than you'd think, based on the price and amount of pieces. And I mean, honestly, it's just a really fantastic set with some fantastic figures based on a fantastic scene in a fantastic movie. And really, what better combo of circumstances is, is there than that? So overall, yes, I would recommend you get the set as soon as possible, it is, I can't say my favorite set of the new line, because that honor is probably gonna go to the night bus for the 2019 sets, but it's still really fantastic. I love the set, and I think that if you have the money to get it, I would recommend picking it up as soon as possible. So thank you all so much for watching this pretty long video, and I will see you all in my next video. But for now, Mischief Managed.